All right, well, good morning. How are you? Good to see you. I'm so glad you're here with us as we are continuing to live despite all of the challenges of the coronavirus and the things that are coming against us. It's not easy to try to keep, keep things moving along, but, you know, with God's power, God's help, we're going to do that. We are beginning a new series today called No Regret Living. In other words, we don't want anything to keep us from living the full life that God has for us. There's things that will keep us from doing that. Uh, there's things in our past, regrets in our past. There's things in our future that will hold us back. I was talking to some people uh, the last week or two uh, regarding about, you know, what, what are some of the things that are your biggest fears? And it's interesting, people said there's actually a fair amount of com- uh, com- uh, common unity around it. Uh, but here's some of the things. Um, they weren't always said exactly like this, but uh, let me advance this forward here. Uh, agoraphobia, the fear of open spaces. That's kind of a bummer during the coronavirus because that's where you're supposed to be, right? If you're outside, you want to be out where, you know, there's lots of space. Then there's agoraphobia, which is the fear of soft, fuzzy sweaters. That's not super common, but, you know, I mean, that's... Uh, then there's the misophobia. That's the fear of viruses. Some of you have realized, I didn't know I had that, but, you know, maybe that's, that's my fear. Then there is a eophobia. That's fear of being without power, which was us for two days, okay? Uh, I don't know if you lost power. We certainly did this past week. Then claustrophobia, of course, being uh, trapped in confined spaces, you know, like, like in an elevator, if you get trapped in an elevator or something. And then there's castrophobia, that's being stuck in an elevator with a bunch of kids. You know. <laughs> and then, since we're on elevators, there's vineyard phobia, that's the fear of not getting our elevator sometime this year. That might be my own personal fear, but it's certainly something I want to see happen. Then zoophobia, fear of animals. And then there's baby shark phobia. That's the fear of getting an earworm that, about a, some kid's song that you can't get rid of. There's TikTok phobia. That's the fear of being spied on. I already deleted mine, but, you know, you do what you need to do. Skinophobia. That's the fear of having to purchase a whole new football jersey. That's kind of... Uh, <laughs> well, those, those are, you know, kind of co- comic... Fears, but you know, on a serious kind of note, the fear that I told you I talked to a number of people, the common fear that I found with the people I talked to was the fear of the future. I mean, what is the future going to hold? What's it going to look like? Certainly, there's a lot of chaos, and most experts in fields across across all you know all spectrums say that the world will look different. I mean, there's just no way we can go back to a pre-coronavirus world. And so what will that look like? What does that mean? How will that affect me? How will that affect my business, my job, my education, my family? And and so there's some fears that are associated with that. And that can rob you of your peace. That can keep you from living the full life that God has for you. So there's the fear of the future. There's the fear of the past. But let me ask you, what would life look like for you if you knew you only had 30 days to live? I mean, that's kind of a refining question. You know, you kind of get that, and all of a sudden, I only have 30 days to live. What would life look like? How would you respond different? How would you, you know, live differently? And um, I almost called this series, because it's only, we're only doing it four weeks, right? The month of August. So I was almost going to call it, you know, one month to live, but that sounded a little ominous. So, you know, I decided to go with no regret living. But if you only had one month to live, what would your life look like? How would you go about living your life? That's an important question because not everybody lives well. Everybody does die, I and mean, that certainly is something. Death is more universal than life. Everyone dies, but not everyone lives. And so it's, you're, we're all going to die, but will we all live? Well, probably not. I mean, it depends on how you define living. And we're going to look at what God has for you, the kind of life he wants you to live, so you live fully. So if you have one month to live, what would it look like? Well, I'm going to conclude each message of today and through the series with some provocative questions, questions that kind of soul search 
and, and help you to really take that next step because we could just have a message and you just think, well, that's interesting and then nothing comes of it. So what I want you to do is just think about it. Honestly, ask those questions about yourself. Write them down. Type them in your computer, whatever you need to do, and, and think about it a little bit and then run it by somebody else. There's something very clarifying when you talk to somebody else uh, about what you're thinking. And you say, hey, and, and then ultimately you do it. At least you chose, hey, I'm going to do it. I'm going to take a step forward. I'm going to do something. I don't want to just go back to the way it was. So let's look at it. The first thing, I think, that if we had 30 days to live, if you found that out, you'd try to make the most of every day. I mean, you only have 30, right? You're going to make the most of it. And when you have limited money, if you were to go on a vacation, you were to go on a, to a theme park or something, you had a limited money, you had a budget, you would be very uh, conscious about how you spend it, right? You'd say, well, I only have so much. I don't know, you know, I don't want to run out before the end of the day. I might have, want a gift at the end. I might want to do something later, and I want to make sure and preserve this money so that I can maximize it. Well, that is the way we would view our time if you only had 30 days to live. You'd say, I only have 30 days. I'm going to maximize this. And really, this is a clarifying question. And it's important because a lot of times we put a higher value on money than we do on our life, than our time. The truth is you can always make more money, but you can't get more time. And so time is way more value. I know people that they save every penny but they squander and waste hours upon hours. And they've got it reversed. They've got it reversed. And so making, looking at your life, using a clarifying question like this, if I only had 30 days to live, how would my life be changed? And you'd say, well, I want to make the most of it. The Bible says, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. So it's something we learn, and you go, I want to learn and recognize I have Limited time, right? I, I have a numbered amount of days. I can't get those back. Teaches how, to sh how short our lives really are, the, another translation says. And so being conscious that, hey, I, I'm not going to live forever. I came across this comedian. Here's how he talks about the brevity of life. He says, do you realize that the only time in our lives when we like to get old is when we're kids? If you are less than 10 years old, you are so excited about aging that you think in fractions. How old are you? I'm four and a half, right? How many times have we heard that? I'm four and a half. I'm three and a half. He goes, I'm four and a half. You are never 36 and a half. You're four and a half going on five. That's the key. Then he says, you get into your teens and now they can't hold you back. You jump to the next number. Even maybe a few ahead. How old are you? I'm going to be 16. You could be 13, but you're going to be 16. Then the greatest day of your life, you become 21. Even the words sound like a ceremony. You become 21. But then you turn 30. Oh, what happened there? Makes you sound like bad milk. He turned. We had to throw him out. There is no fun now. You just soured. You become 21, but you turn 30. And then you're pushing 40. Whoa, put on the brakes. It's all slipping away. Before you know it, you reach 50 and your dreams are gone. <laughs> then you make it to 60. You didn't think you would, but you made it. So you become 21, you turn 30, you push 40, you reach 50, you make it to 60. By now, you've so made up so much speed that you hit 70. After that, it's a day-to-day -day, day -day thing, right? You hit Wednesday. <laughs> then you get into your 80s, and every day is a complete cycle. You think uh, you, you hit lunch, you turn 430, you reach bedtime, into your 90s, you start going backwards. I am just 92. And then once you hit 100, you go to a kid again. I'm 100 and a half. <laughs> now, I hope that all of you live to 100 and a half. But the truth is we probably won't. Most of us cash in a little earlier than that. 
sometimes way earlier, and recognizing that I have a finite amount of days. You say, God, teach me how short my life really is. Helps me to live here in the moment, not somewhere else. I was at a conference this past week, and this presenter was saying that most people spend only 20% of their day thinking about this day. The rest of the time, the other 80% is either thinking about things tomorrow or things of yesterday. 20%. She challenged. It was a leadership conference saying, hey, great leaders can't just live with 20% in their day. We need more than that. I would propose all of us would do better by living in this moment. So often we live for another day. That's when our dreams will come to pass. That's when I can be happy. That's when I get in shape. That's when my ship comes home. I mean, all these great things happen out there in another day. So that means I can't be happy today. Many people are waiting to live until the someday syndrome. Someday, that's when things will be different. But the truth is, God gave you this day. This is the day. Not yet, not tomorrow, not yesterday, but it's this day. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And so, if you had 30 days to live, there's not a whole lot. I mean, why live? way out there. Why not live right here? And that's certainly a lesson we can bring with us. Living in the moment. Be very careful then how you live. That's a good warning, right? He says, hey, there's possible you could live poorly. So he says, don't do that. Not unwise, but wise, making the most of every opportunity. Another translation would be redeeming the time. In other words, the time that you have, make sure and use it wisely. Use it effectively. Don't squander it. Make it have value. And it has value when you live in the moment, when you live today. And another verse real similar to that says, be wise in the way you act. says, make the most of every opportunity with outsiders. In other words, people that are Outside the faith, people out, they're, they're far from God. We all know people that are far from God. And maybe you've reached out to them before. Maybe you've stepped out and invited them into the faith. You've shared your story. If you haven't, if you had 30 days to live, I think all of us would think, hey, I, I think I'll reach out to that person. It's, you know, maybe, maybe we are hesitant because we're afraid they might reject us. They might think bad of us. They might... They could hold us back from a promotion, you know, all those kinds of things. But when you only have 30 days left, you don't care anymore. You're leaving this planet. You're thinking that's unacceptable that I'm going to leave this planet and they don't, they don't have a secured eternity. I don't know if I ever see them again. That's not acceptable. So you'd put all that stuff aside and you'd reach out to them. And so we need to put that stuff aside, making the most of every opportunity with people that are far from God. That's a big part of it. Here's some questions I told you at the end of each point. I want to like give you some probing questions. What are the biggest time wasters in your life? What would you stop doing if you only had 30 days to live? And what would you start doing? And so write that down. Think about it. Say, hey, what, what would my life look like if I only had 30 days to live? And here's some questions that you could ask. The second thing is just take risks. Take risks. You don't play it safe. Now, there's a tendency for us to play it safe, right? Because it's, there's security in that. Playing it safe. But we're meant to have some risk in our life. I mean, we're wired that way. So often, we try to protect our lives and we strip out all of the risk-taking so that life is boring. And then we need some excitement back in, so we fly to Las Vegas. You know, I need something exciting it's life's too boring why because you stripped all the excitement out we're, we're that's our tendency and so we're supposed to live risk-taking lives now i'm not saying dumb stuff i'm not saying take all of your you know life savings and put it in tesla stock or something like that or go you know into a party with people nobody has masks no social distancing just going hey man who cares about the coronavirus i'm not there's plenty of things that you can do that are like dumb risk-take. I'm not saying that. I'm saying risk-take that makes sense, but you're, 
I mean, the odds might be against you, but you're sensing God's doing this. You're sensing this is part of the fulfillment of your dream. And you think, you know what? Yeah, it might fail, but I'm going to pursue what I feel God is calling me to do. You know, I love how Jesus, when he had 30 days to live or less, he, he was a risk taker. He, was, he could have hid out. Nobody knew where he was at. He could, but instead he goes, you know, I'm going to Jerusalem to his disciples. The disciples go, Jesus, this is not a smart move. This is dangerous. But see, it was part of his mission. He knew that. But they were saying, that's, that's the lion's den. I mean, you're going down into the front lines. You're, you're going to go right where the enemies are. He goes, that's where we're going. That's where we're going. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. In other words, with focus, with passion. Hey, I'm going there. John 11, we're told that he, uh, that he hears that, uh, they hear that his friend died, and that's right near Jerusalem. And he goes, hey, we're headed there on our way. And they go, hey, listen, you shouldn't go. It's too dangerous. Jesus goes, I'm going. I'm going. So taking risks sometimes is the very thing we need to do in order to pursue God's dream for us, what God has for us. You know, if you're familiar with the story of David and Goliath, before David became king, he was just a a young guy. And he fought this huge giant, Goliath. Goliath was a Philistine. And he was, he was like the biggest, baddest dude they had. And so they came up with this plan. They said, hey, we'll tell the Israelites, because they were in, uh, across the, a gorge from each other. They were yelling insults at each other. And, and then uh, they said, hey, we'll bring our, our baddest dude. You bring out yours. And whoever wins, wins the day, wins the battle. And they agreed to it. Well, they didn't know they had Goliath. He whipped, they whip out this guy. He comes out. He's massive. I mean, his armor alone weighs 125 pounds. He's carrying a spear. The spear tip is 15 pounds. I mean, this guy is a monster. Well, they don't, nobody's like that on, in the Israelite camp. So nobody wants to go out. So King Saul, who's the king of the Israelites, he's concerned nobody's going out to fight this Philistine. So he goes, well, listen, whoever goes out, I'll give you a huge pot of cash. Uh, you'll live tax-free the rest of your life. You can marry one of my daughters. Come on out, baby. No, he didn't do that. But he does offer one of his daughters. Because you can marry one of my daughters. And nobody, no, nobody still goes out. They stay safely in the camp. And then David comes. He's just a, he's a little guy. He says he has a ruddy face, which means he's not even shaving yet. He shows up. He sees what's going on. He sees Goliath making fun of his God and all this stuff. And he sees all the discouraged people around. And so David says, no one should be discouraged. This is David saying this. Because he goes, I'll go and fight this guy. I don't care how big he is. Now, the odds were against David. It did not look like he could win. I mean, he's a little guy. This guy is a trained warrior. He's huge. He's, you know, he's, he's got a reputation. David's reputation is, he's just, he watches sheep. So the king calls him in and says, "Uh, you're a shepherd. This guy's a trained warrior. What makes you think you can win? Well, here's what he says. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. Yeah, that's true. I'm a shepherd. But he goes, let me tell you my resume. When a lion or a bear came and carried off the sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. I mean, that's close combat, right? I mean, he's grabbing the sheep. You know, I probably would have thought, well, that sheep's gone but I'll still try to kill it. I mean, if I had that kind of courage. He's, he's trying to still rescue the sheep. I'm going to kill you and rescue the sheep. I'm doing it all in one blow. When it turned on me, which it would, right? I seized it by its hair. Could you imagine a lion or a bear? I mean, you know, grab it by its hair. It's kind of like, that's like killing it with an attitude, right? struck it and killed it your servant has killed both the lion and the bear this uncircumcised philistine will be like one of them because he has defiled the armies of the living god the lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this philistine and so he does that he goes in all he's got is a slingshot and some rocks this guy's got a sword a spear armor the whole enchilada And David wins. He wins the day. The odds are against David. Anybody watching would have said, if they were betting, which they probably did, right? You know, 
let's put some bet on that. I, I mean, it was worse than 101. 100, I mean, it looked bad that David would win, but he does. Sometimes it's the least, you see, all, you know, so like the, the, the least common person you would expect, the person who surprises you. And that person might be you. You know, in 1991, there was a Kentucky Derby, great race, because there was a horse who was in last place. The horse's name was Strike the Gold. And I want to show you this race because it's, it's pretty spectacular. The, I mean, you don't even hear his name up front by the announcer because he's in last place. And he has, this horse has to go around on the outside in order to catch up and ultimately wins the race from last place. Tremendous from behind, from the back, from the rear, last place to front place. Watch this. This is 1991 Kentucky Derby. Strike the gold wins it. Watch. They're all in line. And they're off in the Kentucky Derby. And Lost Mountain was squeezed a bit at the start. On the extreme outside, Best Pal shows early speed, but Sea Cadet toward the inside quickly takes command. 40-something right up there, and Corporate Report on the outside, Fly So Free, is fourth along the inside, and Hansel between horses is fifth at this point, passing the stands for the first time. Three of them battle on the front end. Sea Cadet is expected on the inside, leads by a head. 40-something is second, and Corporate Report on the outside is right there third. Fly So Free, tucked in at the rail, is racing fourth by a head. Allie David is fifth at this point. Then Hansel on the outside, six, six lengths off the leader. Then it's Lost Mountain at the rail, saving ground in seventh. Best Pal bullies his way between horses eight. And another review is on the move ninth on the outside. Then comes Main Minister in tenth. It's four lengths farther back. Happy Jazz Band is 11th. Strike the Gold is 12th. Quintana on the outside is 13th. Then a gap of five to Paul Riss, wilder than ever, and Green Alligator, 16th and last at the back of the pack. The half mile in 46 and two fifth seconds. It's not exceedingly fast. Chris McCarron has slowed down the pace on the front end, and he still leads it with C. Cadet. 40-something, the long shot, part of the mutual field up there in second, and now Corporate Report with a big move, and on the outside, Hansel is in gear. Main Minister is also charging up in the middle of the racetrack. Fly so free, bides his time fifth along the inside, best pal, and strike the goal begins to roll on the outside. They're tightly packed as they move to the top of the stretch. C. Cadet on the inside leads by a head. Fly so free now moves quickly between horses. Strike the gold is closing stoutly in the middle of the racetrack. Main Minister is right there and down the stretch they come. Strike the gold on the outside with Chris Adley taking command. Along the inside, best pal into the second spot. Main Minister is third. Coming 70 yards to the finish and far away from the rail. Strike the gold wins the derby by a length and a half. Under the wire second was best pal. Then it was a photograph between the long shot main minister and from far back, Green Alligator was in the photo for the show spot. That's a great, let's watch it again. No. <laughs> I love that. I mean, from behind, from the back, the odds were against this horse and the jockey, but they won. And, you know, I think when I watch that, I think, you know, that could be me. That could be me if I choose to follow a dream and I don't have the resources, I don't have, uh, I'm too old, or you might say I'm too young, or I'm not educated enough, or I don't have the right pedigree, or the, all of the excuses. But when we trust God and we live for the day, and then we take risks, God shows up time and time again and helps us to do well, helps us to succeed. I love this quote by the great ice hockey Players and then coach, you miss 100% of the shots you never take. 100, that's true. I mean, if you don't take a shot, you're going to miss that one, right? I mean, it just doesn't happen. And so often we think, well, I might not do well, so I shouldn't even try. Why even take a risk of, sh of taking, a, taking, taking a shot? Because it's true, you might not do well. But, you know, Jesus talks about, and he praises people that take risks. He says that's what it means to be a Christ follower is that we take risks. Let me show you a story, one of many that he talks about in taking risks. He says, Jesus told the story of a king who went on a journey and entrusted three of his servants, three servants with sums of money to invest in his absence. So he gives them each a bag of cash. Invest this is what they're told. The, two, the first two servants invested the money 
and they doubled it. That's pretty good, right? The third servant was afraid. He was afraid, so he didn't want to take a risk of losing the money, so he buried it. That's safe. You bury it. Don't let anybody know. King comes back. Here it is. I have, I played it safe. And he played it safe. When the king returned, he met each to see how he had done. The first two were praised. Why? Because they had risk taken. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many. Come and share your master's happiness. Now the story shifts. But with the third servant, the master was slightly upset. No, he's furious. He's furious. He says, that's a terrible way to live your life, playing it safe. A terrible way. It's criminal to live cautiously like that. Take his money and give it to the one who risked. He risked. Not because he doubled, but because he risked the most. And get rid of the play it safe who won't go out on the limb and then just, you know, I don't even want you around me. He's just, he's, he's super upset, right? Let me ask you a question. What do you think the king's response would have been? If they had, both the two guys had lost money and not doubled it. Lost money. I think he would have praised himself. I think that certainly is what we see from this. I mean, he's not, hey, it's great that they doubled, but what they're being praised for is being risk takers. And when you're taking risk, inherently it means it may not turn out like you wanted it to. You might actually lose money. Things might not go the way you would hoped they'd go. But I think they would have still been praised because they still risk. He would have said, you know what, we'll get them next time. Great job, you risk took, you, you, you gave it your best shot. And that's what I was looking for. You taking a risk with your life. Don't play it safe. I love this quote by Theodore Roosevelt. You've probably heard it before. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out the strong man, how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. There's plenty of those people. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows how great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who at best knows the, in the end the triumph of high achievement, that's what we're all wanting, right? but who at worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly. He took a risk. He took a risk. So that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither knew victory nor defeat. We don't want to be in that group. The king in, story, in Jesus' story said, you don't want to be in that group. You want to be somebody who makes each day count. You want to be the person who takes risks. And then third, you want to get connected with God. Now, if you only have 30 days to live, that is certainly going to be one of the things you're going to get right. You're going to start to at least pursue it. I've talked to a number of people that have days or weeks to live, sometimes hours. And they called a pastor, so I've probably had more opportunities to be there than most of you. And you're there at the, their deathbed, and this is on their mind. This is, and you know what? There's nothing wrong with that. I think that's a good thing. It's better late than never getting correct, connected with God. Better late than never. But it's better early than late. But better late than never, the thief on the cross, Jesus, when he was crucified, there was two criminals on either side. One died in his sin. The other one asked Jesus to forgive him. He said, I, wanna, I don't want to go into eternity not knowing where, I, where I'm going to land. And so he asked Jesus, he said, can I go with you into heaven? And Jesus' response is, yeah, today you'll be with me in paradise. Today you're going to be going into heaven right with me. Deathbed conversion. It's great. But, as I said, better early than late because that way God can start to do something in your life today. He can unleash the power that he has for you today. He can deposit into your heart hope and love and peace 
and the things that the world is always clamoring for, hoping to try to purchase them or get them in some way, and they're only found by going to God. God supplies us richly with those things that the world cannot provide. And you get those from the Lord. And you go to Him. Now, there's an enemy, a, a thief, not the thief on the cross, but the thief who is Satan. And he, that, that thief, Satan, wants to steal, kill, and destroy your life. Some of you have felt his effects on your marriage, on your business, on your health. I mean, that's what the thief wants to do, but that's, here's what Jesus wants to do. He says, but I have come that you can have life, and you'd have it to the full. Abundant life. Overflowing life. He says, that's what I want for you. I want you to have that. But there's a thief who's trying to steal that from you. You see, we all have regrets. We're talking about a no-regret life. All of us have regrets. Regrets. It's what you do with them that makes the difference. It really is. It's what you do with your, with your regrets. Some people, they, they sink into a hole of, of regret, of self-pity. And listen, there is no place for self-pity in God's kingdom. No place. We all can fall into that. And let me just say, as a leader... If, you're, if God's called you to be an influencer, which I believe he has, nobody will follow somebody who wallows in self-pity. Don't do it. If you're, if you're there in that place, go find somebody who's worse off than you and who's happier than you and worse off than you, and you'll say, I don't really have anything to complain about. And God can work something in your life. He can help you. Look at what he does with your regrets when you bring them. He says, distress that drives us to God. So we all have distress in our lives. Some will drive us to God, to connect with God. He goes, that turns us around. It gets us back in the way of salvation. We never regret that kind of pain. All of us have pain. Some of you, you'll let your pain drive you to God. And he says, rejoice in that. That's the whole point of it. God will restore you. God will heal you. God will put you back up on the rock. He'll put a new song in your mouth. That's what he'll do. God's good. But that's a choice each of us have to make. You have to make that choice. I'm going to let God take my regrets. And he's going to, he's going to use that pain in a redemptive way. And, and he's, I'll, I'll be more compassionate. I'll be more caring about others. I'll, I'll hold on a little less lightly to what the world offers. But not everybody does that because... There's another group, but those who let distress drive them away from God. So there's two criminals on the cross. One, his pain, his distress drove him to Jesus. The other one, not so much. And they're full of regrets. End up on the deathbed of regrets. Some of you have lived in that deathbed of regrets way too long. You know, Jesus had... 12 disciples, two of them, really played a prominent role right there before he died. And that's Peter and Judas, Judas Iscariot. They both screwed up. They all, both made huge mistakes. Judas betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Peter denied he knew Jesus. In Jesus' presence, Jesus overheard him. And then the final time when somebody said, hey, do you know, are you part of Jesus? Are you one of his followers? He cursed. He said, I and then, you know, don't need to say what Peter said. But he cursed and then said, I, ref I don't know the man. So they both fell into regrets. You see, the difference is Judas fell into a deathbed of regrets. He ended up committing suicide. Peter says, wept bitterly, asked for forgiveness. Jesus hunted him down after his resurrection and restored him. Takes a walk on the beach with him and says, Peter, because Peter denied him three times, so Jesus asked him three times, do you love me? He goes, I love you. He goes, do you love me? He goes, I love you. He said it a third time, and at that time, it wasn't just a third time, it was, I got it. You're restoring me. 
And he goes, Lord, you know I love you. And then he says, okay, you're back on mission. Feed my sheep. Go do what I've called you to do. You see, you can stay stuck in the deathbed of regret. And the thief will try to steal, kill, and destroy everything that's important to you. Or you can rise above it. You can be a risk taker like the king talked about when he said, hey, I, wa- I don't want you to play it safe. Take a risk. And some of you, your big risk is trusting that you can be somebody different than you are today. So often we think, oh, it's done, man. I mean, who, this is who I am. Who says? God is in the business of changing us. And he changes us from the inside out. Say. I've always complained. I just complain. That's who I am. Would you trust that God can take that out of your heart? That's actually not a healthy thing for you. You might think, well, that's part of the way I'm, it's catharsis. It's part of the way I, I, I process my feelings. No, it's actually, a, it's not a healthy thing for you. I'm telling you. That is a sickness to be a constant complainer. And God wants to take that out of your life. How is that possible? Well, It's risk-taking. It's trusting that God. You kind of give that to God. Start to confess that. See, if you complain once, and you complain again, and then you complain again, and then complain, you know what? You're a complainer. You go, I'm not a complainer. I just have some justified gripes. Well, you line them up. Complainer. It's true with lying, right? I mean, if you lie once, you lie again, you lie again, you lie again, what are you called? Right. So you give those things to God. You say, God, this is what I bring to you, the broken part of me. God has the ability and the passion to change that, to redeem that, to restore who he sees you to be. It's just coming to God saying, God, and you know, there's nothing... I love the motivation of having 30 days to live because that motivates you. Man, i got to get this right. I don't have decades. I have days. And God can do it today. He can do it today. Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord, I pray for your presence, Lord, to come. We usher it in, Lord. By ourselves, we can do nothing. We just get swallowed up with our worries of the future, with our regrets of the past. It eats up today, and then the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy the things that we love. Today, Lord, I I just pray that every person here would take a stand right now, right here, and say no more. No more. No more stealing or destroying or killing the things that I love. I can't, I don't have in it in me enough to fight Satan, but I know if I follow Christ, he can do it on my behalf. That's why we call out to God. He's the one who can, who can set your feet upon a rock and put a new song in your mouth. Why not do that right now? Say, dear God, today. Today is a day where I want to live with no regrets. I'm going to let you take them and use them for your purposes. I'm not going to worry about the future and the fear of the future. Today I want to live in the moment and make the most of this day. You say, God, help me to take risks. It might be different for, for some of you, but I've feel like God wants some of you to trust him with your life. That he can make you different. You know, the past is the best prediction of the future unless you let God change it. God can change your future. He'll break the curse. He'll give you a new start. Right now, just go to God and say, God, today, let that be me. I want to be your follower. I want to follow you with all my heart, 
all my soul, all my strength, all my mind. I want to trust you with the very parts of, that, are, that are most important to me. If you've never done this before or this is your first time, that's just prayer. That's trusting your, your life with God. That's the beginning. It doesn't mean you're going to be perfect. It means you're starting on the journey. Jesus invites you to follow him. Not other people, not even the church. You follow him. You say, God, today, right now, right where you're at, would you say, God, today I want to follow you. Thank you for inviting me on this journey with you. Give me the courage and the strength to continue on. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Last questions. Hey, listen, here's the way to, there it is, my last questions for you to look over, uh, to think about, hey, I want to I wanna continue my, my pathway with God. And then we're going to take the offering. If you would, stand with me. This is the way we like to encourage you to give. Uh, many of you, everybody gives digitally nowadays, other than a few people mailing in their checks. But uh, we, if, if you haven't given this week and you'd like to, this is your church, we encourage you to give in one of these formats here. Probably the easiest is texting 45777. And then in the uh, place where you uh, type in, you just put in VCC space and then your gift. And I just want to just thank you for being part of what we're doing here. We're excited about uh, this new series and what God's doing. And, you know, I mean, this hurricane came through. and We have a lot of trees in our yard and there's limbs everywhere. But, you know, most of those limbs, they were kind of they were kind of dead anyways. And they were and they were they were on the edge and they were they, they, there was some rot on some of them. And and, and so there's some cleanup to do. But I believe that, you know, it's, it was only a matter of time till they came down anyways. And so when a, 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 a wind blows, like the coronavirus or some of the stuff that we're going through, it, it does shake the church. It shakes us and it shakes our businesses. It shakes th- our church. And we, you know what, I believe that God will use it for good. God will use it for good. Some of those things needed to, you know, be taken away. And he's going to, there's something going on there. And I don't, I'm, he's bigger than me. I don't understand it all, but I'm not giving up. I'm not like, dang, there was a bad hurricane. I guess I'm cashing in. No, I'm going to clean up, get back to work, get back to living. Let me pray for you, Father. Thank you, Lord, for every person here. Lord, I pray for the households that are represented. Lord, you protect us. You watch over us. We just entrust you with those things in our, that are so dear to us. Lord, I pray for those who aren't here, they're uh, in isolation. Lord, provide for them, protect them, watch over them. Lord, we pray for wisdom for our scientists. Help us to have a breakthrough in this vaccine, Lord, that it's a healthy, effective vaccine, safe. Lord, we pray for our country, our leaders, and all of the st- challenges that they're facing. Lord, give them wisdom. Give them courage. Give them grace. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We have step two right after this service. If you'd like to take step two, you'll see it on the way out. Jump right in there. I'll be in there to meet you there. We also have prayer for you up here. Come on up and receive prayer, and uh, God bless. See you next week.